Hey everyone, welcome to another Common UI tutorial. In this video, we're gonna be covering another Common UI widget, which is going to be the bound action bar. Now, for this video, I do already have the settings set up for enhanced input as well as for the data tables. Now, if you want to see how to go about setting that up, I have the links within the description. I just didn't wanna spend 20 minutes of this video showing you and explaining how to get all that set up. I will go a brief overview to just showcase what I currently have set up and then what you would need as well. But those videos that I have linked will provide a lot more information, a lot more walkthrough if you're looking for that. Anyways, within this video, we're gonna be covering not only the design aspect of the bound action bar, we're also gonna show how the buttons actually tie into the action bar. So I think that's one of the biggest things that a lot of people don't have clarification on. So I took some time to look into all of the buttons, what they tie into, what's currently possible within Blueprints. Now, of course, there's a lot of functionality you could get into if you actually went into the C++ files. However, if you have questions that, I would just recommend join the Discord and we can talk a bit more there. Uh, this channel focuses a lot on Blueprints and we're gonna show what's possible within Blueprints. So yeah, let's get into it. So let's show you what I currently have set up. I did do the settings aspect, but I did not do the widgets themselves. Now I'm focusing on the widgets, but I'll show you the settings really quickly. So if we go into here, the main thing about Common UI is to make sure, not only is the plugin turned on, you also need to make sure that the viewport is turned on. So you go ahead and turn that on, it will make you restart. I'm not gonna do that yet because I need to go into other things. We're gonna go into the input settings. Now I already created an input data, if I actually open this up, I currently have my enhanced input action set up as well as the data table. Now I'm not really using the data table much. I'll showcase a little at the end because the functionality is about the same no matter which route you go. Enhanced input just has a lot more steps in order to enable it. However, I'm not going into the enabling itself. I do have these inputs set up. So if we actually went into the enhanced input, I have all of these, and then they're all within a input mapping context. Again, there is a link that will explain all of that. And then within, I have a base widget that is completely empty with just a canvas. Within the blueprint, all I do is I create the widget, and then I just set it to UI mode with showing I also add the mapping context as well. So very simple stuff with the input actions. And then I'm going to change the gamepad to be the generic. So by default, it will turn gamepad on. That's really important to do because if you do not, uh, no icons actually show when the game starts. I add my controller data. I'm not going into that as well, just because I've done about like six videos on that. And then also enable enhanced input support. I do recommend you to use enhanced input over the data table because data table is a bit outdated. It's a lot more manual. So if you have the time, learn enhanced input action support with Common UI, it's worth it. But in order to turn that on, you have to toggle this on and that will allow you to also get these options for enhanced input and then you can go about using it. But by turning it on, it will then stop the data tables from working. So with that, let's go ahead and restart our project and get into the widgets. So before we actually get into the bound action bar itself, we actually have to create our buttons first. So we need to create a button base as well as an action button. So we're gonna go ahead with the action button first just because it's actually extremely simple to set this up. So under our widgets, we're gonna go into, I guess we could go widget blueprint. We'll set action button. We want the common bound action button. Let's just call this UI button base. I'm actually gonna make another folder and just call it button. I'm gonna throw that in there. It, we'll just make it a little cleaner. And then within this, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab a horizontal box. I called it button base, but this one should be action button because of the type that I used. Now within an action button, 
we actually need two widgets in order to make this work, because otherwise if we hit compile, we'll notice that we get errors. It's telling us that we need a common action widget. The common action widget is essentially the input actions icon. It's the icon that will reflect whatever input is set, whether it is a data table input or enhanced input action, it will showcase that icon based upon whether you're using a gamepad, whether you're using mouse keyboard and things like that. So one thing that you could actually tell for yourself is that, okay, so we do need the common action widget. We also need a common text. If we actually shift to this bind widget section, open up widget, and it will tell us the widget that we need as well as the name of the widget that it needs to be. So we need a common text and we need to name it text action name. So let's go ahead and go into common text, drag that in over here. We also need to make sure it's called text action name. So we'll go to text action name. And we'll notice when we hit compile, we're going to lose two of these errors. And like that, we're able to hide the, the errors that are showing. Now, one thing you'll notice is that, okay, well, we compiled, everything disappeared. So theoretically, you could move on, which you can. The action button will always require a text field. So it's a bit annoying because the action button itself doesn't have the ability to hide text. The only way to do that is to do a workaround, which I'll go into in a second, but you don't need to have the icon with it. So it's a bit annoying that you could do one way, but you can't do the other. So next we actually need the widget. This is for our icon and we need to call it input action widget, input action widget and hit compile. So let's go back to our hierarchy. We now have both available. I'm gonna go ahead and put the text in the direct center. And the input action is now shown over here. The main important thing is that we don't need to set any input action directly on the button because that will be taken when we are creating our bound action bar. However, to make sure your settings are correct, when you use the design time key, so let's hit one, an icon should appear. If the icon is not appearing, this means that either your controller data is not working, it means that your enhanced input actions did not get set properly. Usually the issue people have is with the metadata. So just go ahead, make sure that all of them are set. The main thing that tends to be wrong is the controller data. Uh, that generally impacts everything. So if we went into project settings, go into input settings. You want to make sure controller data is entered in. You also want to make sure that if you are set to gamepad, it is set to generic or whatever gamepad name you are using. If you're using other types of uh, controller types, make sure that you're using the correct name, but do make sure the data is entered in. And then also that the input data is set as well. That's the important thing. If you're not seeing an icon set within the design. Now, before that, we now need to create a style. Otherwise our button's not really going to work perfectly. So let's go ahead and create a brand new style within here. I'm going to do a brand new folder and we're going to call this just style. I'm going to do, nope, we're going to do button style and then we'll just call this base. And then for this, I like to actually reopen it because I get super annoyed that it opens up the event graph. And what we need to do is essentially use some colors. I have some colors on the side that I'm going to be using. So basically variations of kind of like an orange and brown. I used it throughout all my videos, so I'm just reusing it. You can use any other colors to help you dignify what is currently a base hovered and press state. And then next we need to create a textile. So we'll do textile base. Always get annoyed with that event graph. It always gets in my way. 
And then for the font, I'm gonna go ahead and select. The other thing is if the font is not appearing, make sure that you enable the engine content because if you turn it off, you'll notice that no options become available. Unless you have your own custom font, we want to turn that on so that we can see that. I'm gonna turn this into 40 and that will be it for here. Now I'm gonna go ahead and copy this with shift and well, I'm left-handed, so it's left click. It's probably reverse for you. And then just paste with my shift right click. Now I have a button base that can be used for both my action button and the base button, which is set here. And we'll also notice our text is now black. So it's all set, we're all good to go. That's our action button. Let's go ahead and create the button base. So in here, we'll do button base, and this will just be UI button base. I'm gonna go ahead and actually copy all of this. Hit compile. Let's set this to button base. The only difference is that for our text, let's also make sure to set this to TS base. And we actually have to create some functions for this so that we can properly set our button uh, text because within an action button, the text itself will turn into whatever action it is set. So if, for example, you were using, uh, let's say we're using the print option, this text is going to turn into print. However, within our button base, nothing will happen. It will stay as text block. It does not get adjusted. So let's go ahead and remove that. I'm going ahead and close that as well so we just don't go back and open it. And then I'm gonna remove this, leave that as empty. I'm gonna go into the graph. I'm gonna create a... I guess I don't need to do a custom event. Yeah, that's fine. And we'll just do, we need to turn this actually into a variable first, skipping ahead a little bit. Drag this off and we'll do set text. And promote to variable. Let's go ahead and expose this as such. And that's so that when we create the button, we can decide what to show the text as. The next thing I want to do is the on clicked. And we'll do print. We'll do append. We'll do button space, and then we're gonna grab our text and just plug that in. This will tell us whenever we click the button, which button we're actually click. That way it's just visibly apparent to everyone. And then I'm actually gonna copy that. I shouldn't have closed this action button too soon. We're gonna go ahead and paste that here, but instead I'm gonna do action. Delete that. Let's go ahead and make this a variable. We need the, uh, what was it called? Text block, text action name. There we go. And text right here and plug that in. Hit compile. So now whenever we click an action button, we'll also get the current text as well. That gives us our base button and our action button. Let's go back into the designer. Last thing that I believe I skipped is that when you click on the action button itself, we want to actually showcase display in action bar. And then I also close this button as well. Skipping ahead, display an action bar. 
This will allow the whatever input is assigned to this button to show within our actual action bar, which we'll also get into in a little. So closing all that, we have all of that roughly set up. Now we're going to go ahead and grab our action, our bound action bar. I'm going to assign it to the bottom and I'm going to have it take about half of the screen. I'm also going to hold control because it will cause everything to stretch. Grab this corner, hit control. And now it fills up the bottom. I'm going to rename this just to action bar. It's a lot easier to view. When hitting compile, it will tell us that we're missing a button class. So within this, this is where we end up using our action button. And it should be the only option available unless you have multiple buttons, then that's all on you. So within this, there's a lot of different settings, which I will explain all of them in a moment. But once we kind of get a little bit further, we'll explain into that. As of right now, what we need to do is make sure that we can populate these action buttons. The main thing is that when we are creating our action buttons, we set the class here. But in order to populate anything within the action bar, we require a button that is set somewhere else in the UI in order to populate it. So within Blueprints specifically, unless there is a button that has the settings of a specific input, you will not be able uh, to see it in the action bar. If you go into C++, you can actually uh, expose some more functions to allow you to do that. But at this time, you're just not able to within Blueprints. To kind of show you how that works, I'm gonna go ahead and grab a button base. We'll drag that off here. And we'll also drag the action button. So I'm gonna go ahead and just do button base and then action button. I'm gonna make the size 100 and we'll just do 300, maybe 400. And this one we'll also do 400. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong place. Go back, 400, 100. Drag this here and then we'll drag this here. This just allows the anchors to make sure they're not messed up. Within our button base, since I'm using enhanced inputs, I'm going to go ahead and select. If you are using data table, you can go ahead and select and go through here and select as such. Since I have enhanced input, that will not work because I have this enabled. I'm going to go ahead and use the tab left for this left one. And then for here, I'm going to go ahead and use the tab right. So within this, you see text block is being shown and this one has no text. So I'm going to go ahead and just put in uh, cheese. And for this, we have text blocks. Let's go ahead and make sure that our activatable widget has auto activate on. Uh, that tends to be forgotten, forgotten quite often, either by myself or by others. So that'll allow it to showcase as well. And then we're also going to just turn on back handler as well as back handler displayed in action bar. And we're going to go ahead and hit play. And right away, we'll notice a few things. One is our action bar showcasing three things instead of two. Also, cheese is shown up here while the action bar, the action button on our right side has absolutely nothing shown. So if we click on this, we'll see action is empty. So there's no text, there's no icon. If we click on cheese, it says button cheese. So that's being shown. If we click on where we see button left, we'll notice that wait, button cheese and tab left is being shown. If we hit tab right, we see blank is being shown and then tab right. You hit back and it hits back and then we see nothing. So a couple things going on here. By reopening this, the reason why when we hit tab left, we see two options and we hit tab right, we see two options is because any button that you select within the action bar will also trigger the original button it's coming from. 
that's one of the things that are a little bit annoying when it comes to the action bar because the fact that we have to assign it to a button no matter what means that we are tr technically triggering two buttons at the same time. With that, it does mean if I select on this one individually that it will still do this one and it won't do the action button. So if I click over here, we'll notice that that doesn't happen. Next, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna take my PlayStation 4 controller that I currently have. So I'm gonna go ahead and use it. We'll notice that the icons now change. I am now hovering on top of the blank one. I'm gonna go ahead and click the cheese button as L1 and it's currently being fired off. As such, we see button going off. You also notice that I'm pressing L1, which is causing cheese to go off and not the action bar. So if I do left one, we'll notice that that is going through. If I do tab right, we'll notice that's going through. And if I press X instead, I'm now triggering these two instead. And then if I do back, it just causes it to go back and then we see no inputs. The reason why the back is doing that is because we actually don't have any other widget to go back to. So within this widget, if we hit back, then nothing happens. We lost focus, everything is gone. So that is the main reason why that's happening. So if we go into play and do back, we'll notice that even with autofocus, things aren't working. And that's because we have no way to redirect where we're going. So that doesn't do anything for us. That's why back breaks. And the back button is shown is because we show is back action displayed in action bar. This is where I actually go into where you can go into C++ and you can actually expose everything instead of just the back button. Because you'll notice that we don't have a button set to back. However, we still see that available. So the functionality is there, but Epic with their wisdom does not show everything and all their functions. So that is unfortunate. So next thing is I'm going to go ahead and set is focusable and then I'm going to go ahead and do the button base. That's just going to set focus directly to our cheese button. The next thing I want to explain is this action button. The main thing with the action button, and I kind of hate that this is being blocking the text, so I'm going to go ahead and do that instead. The reason it's not showing is that the action button is built specifically for the action bar. So if you were to bring it anywhere else, it becomes an empty shell. There's nothing for it and it does nothing. So with that, there is technically a workaround that you could do if you want to showcase icon or not icons, you want to showcase the action bar without actually having another button shown. So what we could do is that, let's go ahead and take this button. Let's go ahead and just hit zero, zero, zero. Let's go over here. And with that, we hit play and we'll notice that it is hidden away, but we still have that tab right and it is clicking it as such. And then if we are over here and we go ahead and hit um, R1, which is tab right, I am firing off that action that we don't see. Of course, you also see that the text block is still there. However, text block actually goes away within the action bar. Or if you also want that to go away, go into your button, the action button. Select on the text and then just delete this here. That will just make that disappear. You won't have anything shown. And then you can still showcase the action button. So by hitting into here, we now still have those options that are shown. So that is something that you could work around and do. Now there's other ways that you can go into polishing it a bit more, such as um, when clicked, you can make the action button do some type of like animations or uh, change the color state, w whatever it is, you can go a bit further into that. I'm not really going into the design purposes, but more so functionalities. So that is something that you could do in blueprints to still show things appearing. 
And with that, you do have the ability to do as many buttons as possible. So if we go into here, let's go ahead and do print. Let's go into here. And then let's do uh, close. We're gonna hit and play. And then now we see, oh, okay, we got three different cheese buttons, but they all have different icons. And then we also see the actual actions themselves. The other part that if you just don't want any text to be shown at all, you can go into the action button, go back to the text, and you can go ahead and set this to collapse. Specifically collapse because it will take up no space. Uh, so if you do hidden, the text still technically takes space. So it's not just the icon. So we go ahead and hit play and we'll see that we just see the icons only. So if you only want the buttons visible, you can do that. The other thing that you can do, I'm going into a lot of things that you could potentially do in here, is that if we go into our add events, oop, I said add events, go into input, or sorry, I think common button, you could do input, either input action triggered or input method changed, different things. But for here, if we did switch as such, depending on your gamepad or mouse and keyboard, you could have different either images appear, different animations, different style, whatever it is, you could go ahead and flip them based upon the input type. So even if it's within the action bar, you still have the functionality of customizing it. And I think that's just really important to explain to everyone as well. Now let's kind of get a bit more focused on the bar itself. Now for the bar, if we hit play, you'll notice we have everything that is just to the left Everything is next to each other. It kind of looks horrendous. Within the bar, so I clicked on it. Under entry layout, I'm gonna go ahead and close this. We'll close display and accessibility. I'm gonna close everything else just because it is irrelevant and not important to us. This is the design portion that for one, I want to state it is not as flexible as I would like. Technically speaking, I would most likely refer to you to create your own just because it allows more functionality. However, if you want to create something simple and this is useful to you, you can go about using that. So to specify is that the bar itself has different types of entries that you can set. So think of it as the bar has its own styles. You can either have it as horizontal, which will do exactly that. We have everything left to right, or you go to vertical, which will have everything up to down. So we hit play. So everything's up down. You can also have wrap. So what wrap does is this is basically a horizontal wrap. So if all buttons, going left to right, end up reaching the end of the widget, it will then go to the next line. So if I were to shrink this, hit play. Uh, oh, I didn't think I shrunk it enough. Let's go ahead and do this, hit play. Like so, we'll see that it ends up going to the next lines where we end up having three lines. Now the same goes for, let me undo that, if we do a vertical wrap. So we're going to go ahead and shrink this, hit play. And we'll notice that now it's going based upon the top to down and then it goes to the next line. It's basically a grid, less customizability than a grid, but you do have that option available. The other thing is radial, which is more of a pain in the butt that I'm not really a fan, but the way it works, if we hit play, um, oh wait, we haven't said anything first. Basically, there is a center point within it, and then all the buttons will go around that center in a 30 degrees 
like a spinning wheel or think of a wheel. It doesn't spin. So let's go ahead and change the starting angle. Let's just say 50. And let's change the central angle to 180, which we'll kind of put that in the center and hit play. So we'll see everything kind of goes around each other in a circular motion, but we're also missing some inputs as well because we actually don't have the back button shown here. So go ahead and exit out of that. I'm going to go ahead and shrink this like so. Hit play. And there we go. By shrinking it down, the circle itself will fit within the widget that you have created. So by stretching it out, we end up seeing that we can end up seeing the back button. So if we actually were to shrink this down a bit more and hit play, now they're a bit more condensed. Of course, still not beautiful, doesn't look good. One of the things I'm not a huge fan of is the way that all of the spacing works, especially for radial. Radial has a lot of potential, but if you're creating based in the bar, it tends to get a bit of a pain based upon the starting angle, which is where you place the first element of the wheel. So, I mean, technically speaking, we could hit zero and hit play. And then the first one is the direct center. And then we end up seeing that we have the other ones that go around. But it doesn't really create a full circle. Especially when you're like, OK, so let's create 360. Because you would think to make things go in a full loop and then actually just places everything on top of each other. So you could do like 359. And you kind of get this weird looking thing. So it ends up not being perfect. So there's a lot of playing around with the percentages and how to get a perfect circle, as well as getting things to kind of be a bit more aligned. Yeah. I'm not a huge fan, but yeah. You're controlling the angle. So that's why 180 was just getting the top half wasn't a perfect circle. And you can't actually put 360 because it just doesn't work. And if you do zero, everything stacks onto each other. Or you could do like one. Oh, I ended up going to nine. But yeah. That's radial. I am not a huge fan. I know I haven't gone into all of these settings, but for radial, the only one that works is in fact the radial box settings. None of that implies. And that's why I went into that first. So we'll go ahead and close that because we're moving on from radial. And then I'm going to go ahead and stretch everything back out by holding control. And I'm going to go ahead and hit overlay. For overlay, it has some functionality to help space things out. So with that, the one that you can use is this one specifically, the spacing pattern. Overlay boxes use this, and it will ignore entry spacing. What it does is either you can control what every index spacing will be like on the X and Y axis. Uh, so X is being left to right, Y is being up to down. So you get to control that spacing. If you only enter in one, it will repeat using that for every entry minus the first index. So kind of want to specify on that part. So for example, let's say on our X axis, let's go ahead and give us a 150 spacing. All of my icons, by the way, are about 100 size. So I want you to remember that because we are using 150 spacing. My icons themselves are 100. So that means spacing is technically 50. So it's a bit math going on, but let's go ahead and hit play. And we'll notice that everything is filled out. It is covering the entire edge. And that is because of our alignment. But we'll also notice that my icons themselves are 100. But since we did spacing of 150, we actually get this extra space that's shown over here. 
So if we close this off, and let's go ahead, instead of doing our horizontal alignment, let's just do center and hit play. And like that, now we can actually see that we have some appropriate spacing and we're being able to control a little bit more. So that's the good thing about the overlay. You can also do fill and you can actually control the percentage of the fill. But if we do here, we'll notice that it looks roughly about the same. The other part I want to show you is that we are using the pattern of 150 only, but let's go ahead and do 125. And then we hit play. And then it uses that pattern of going from, okay, we got 150 spacing. We're then going to go into 125. So we're losing 25 spacing. And then we go back to the 150, 125, and then 150. So it goes in a looping pattern. So that allows you to have a bit more control over spacing, especially if you want the, I don't know, every three to be spaced out or every four to be spaced out. You can go through that. Now, one thing that I found is that it does say that the overlay uses both X and Y for spacing, but it also says that it is for the use of horizontal boxes. And I've actually found that no matter what I enter in here, I have found no difference in anything, no matter what is entered. So could not find a use for the overlay. If you end up finding entry spacing working for overlay, do let me know. But otherwise, I was not able to get that to work. And the other thing is that you can also use the Y axis instead of the X. So if we actually did 100 here, you'll notice that things actually end up going down. And the reason is that with the Y and the X, they are applied every two. So for the first one, it's applied, and therefore they go down 100. And then once it actually goes again, it goes down 100. So you could end up making like a stairs effect if you really wanted to. So if we did 100, deleted that, hit play, we end up getting the stairs that goes all the way down. I'm going to go ahead and do the fill horizontal and hit play. And then we end up having this stairs effect can also end up doing this where we align it to the left and we end up having even legit stairs going throughout. So there's a lot of functionality that you could do. There's a lot of playing around that you can add patterns, etc. It really depends on what you're looking for. Some of this might be a lot more work if you're trying to do something custom with the bar. Lastly, I'm going to go ahead and just kind of showcase the horizontal and vertical. They're actually a lot simpler because for the horizontal, we can control the spacing of the X. So we could go ahead and do like 50, hit play. And then we end up getting that spacing as well. We could do five, hit play. Boop. Uh, do, let's do that. And we'll notice the little padding being shown here. Let's go back to 50 as shown. It's a lot simpler. And I don't think I have to get too much into detail about that because as shown, very, very simple to adjust when it comes to verticals. It's the radial that's, I'm not a huge fan, but I will cover it and explain what they do as well. You can also control the max element size. So this is the size of the buttons. If you hover on top of it, it actually tells you it is vertical and horizontal boxes only. The main annoying thing is you don't actually know which one of these work with what until you actually hover on top and the tips tell you. So if you ever feel confused when looking at it, they will tell you exactly what they are used for. Like where the spacing pattern works for the overlay boxes only and nothing else. It also will work with, if you hover on top of entry size rule, it ends up saying horizontal and vertical boxes only, which I don't find 100% true, but yeah. This will tell you as well with the alignment, even though I also showed you earlier in the video that overlay uses these alignments too. So 
take it with a grain of salt. But that is how we end up using the action bar. You can assign widgets that are not technically within here by making them basically invisible in the corner, but it does require having something set in the input actions and you need to have them set in order to have them displayed. You also need the toggle display and action bar to get them showing. The other thing is that within a widget itself, it also has the ability that says display an action bar. This will not impact your buttons at all if it is turned on or off. It actually doesn't impact anything unless you go into the C++ files and you give it the functionality to do that. It means the options are available. We just don't have it in blueprints yet, but that covers the action bar as well as just how to use buttons with them. I did my best to cover a lot of different use cases. I do know that there's a lot of jumping around in this video. I hope it was useful to you and do let me know in the comments if there's anything else that I could possibly clarify with it. I did my best to go through all of them as well as the settings and mention a lot of the settings and possibilities that I could think of. Anyways, thanks for watching. Please hit that subscribe button, join the Discord, join the membership, all of this self-promo stuff. It's great having you watching.